because Christ is alive, we can have life to the fullest. Let's celebrate it today. Come on.
Hey, how about it, church? He's alive, amen. He's alive. He is risen. He's alive. Hey, man, I'm hey, so glad you guys are here. You can have a seat. But hey, as you sit down, just look around real quick. Like, isn't this awesome? Like, you guys feel good? Like, I woke up this morning just hyped. Anybody feel hyped this morning? Like, I just need like a seatbelt or something to kind of strap me in because I feel hyped. Like, he's alive. Our king is alive. He's victorious. I'm telling you, it's something worth celebrating. Amen? Hey, I'm so glad you guys are here. If I had a chance to meet you, my name is Daniel Hicks. I have the honor and joy of serving as the campus pastor here. And we are just honored you would be with us and join us for Easter, whether you're in the room or online or sitting in your car, out in the lobby or in the theater. I mean, man, good on you guys. I saw some of y'all got here like at 8.30, saving seats. Some of y'all trying to sell your seats. I'm like, come on, guys. Come on, guys. Like, actually, I got a seat over here. Hey, 50 bucks, you can have my seat. I'm just kidding. Hey, but hey, we're having fun because we're here to celebrate King Jesus and his resurrection from the grave. He didn't stay dead. He's alive to reign over death and to give us freedom and new life. And so we've come to celebrate him. I'm so glad you're here with us. Hey, I'm glad you're here. And he dressed up. Again, as you looked around, did you see some cool outfits? Like, you guys look so awesome. Like, I actually tucked my shirt in today in, in, in honor of King Jesus. That's awesome. So if you tucked your shirt in today and you wore a special outfit, I just want to remind you, there's a photo booth right down the hall here. Um, I know moms, you want those photos, so dad, just oblige your wife. Kids, do it. Just do it. For your mom, for your grandma, go grab some photos back here in the hallway. And as you're in the lobbies, this lobby back here around campus, make sure you grab the new April newsletter. This is going to tell you everything you need to know about what's happening uh, here in the life of North Metro and what we're up to. And one of the things I want to point out that we're up to is a thing called Hunger Night of Worship. Who's been to a Hunger Night of Worship? Yeah, like, I'm excited. I'm glad you're excited. I need you to bring that same energy for April 25th, which is our next Hunger Night of Worship. It's a night we set aside where we just try to have extended time to sing to King Jesus and make much of him. And we also celebrate baptisms. Come tell you, Jesus is alive and he's changing lives. And so people on that night are gonna go public with their faith and tell the world and their family and their friends who are watching, I love God. Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, hey, come celebrate what God is doing and how he's changing lives on April 25th. So make that a priority to be here. Put it on your calendar. But speaking of things that we're doing and have done, who was here last night for the festival? Anybody here for the festival? Yeah. Last night we had a free community festival from five days. We had a service here. And afterwards we had this festival. I mean, it was amazing. Like you got on campus and the smell of meat was grilling out there. I'm like, there's something different about church when you walk through a cloud of just meat on the grill smell, I'm like, man, praise God for that. Amen, Jesus, I love you. But it was a great night. We had uh, just games and just celebrating. The family was here, free food, fun. It was a great night. I'm telling you, it was all free. It was all worth it because God is up to something. And uh, also it was free because of you guys being super generous in your tithes and your offers. So thank you so much for giving to the mission and vision North Metro. It's because of your generosity and your obedience that we're getting to be the hands and feet of Jesus across our community and do things like that festival last night and also reach out to the, the world and let people know that Jesus loves them and cares for them. And so if you're a family member today and you want to continue to give, you can give a tither offering online. You can give through the app or there'll be a, a host team member at the back of whatever environment you're in. They'll have a basket and you can give a physical tither offering today um, if you feel led to do so. But in just a moment, our lead pastor is about to come out and open up the Word of God. We're going to end our series called Famous Last Words, where Jesus is on the cross. He says, to tell us that it is finished, paid in full. He paid for our debt, and he is victorious. And so as we prepare our hearts to hear for what God wants to say to us, I want to invite you, church, we just stop, and let's just continue to worship God by praying and telling him how good he is. And so pray with me. Father, I love you, and I'm hyped today because you're not in the tomb. You're not dead. You're alive. You went to a cross. We celebrate that on Friday. You went to a cross to, to lay down your life, to pay for our sin, to pay for our debt, to declare that you love us. You've come to set us free. And God, they, they took you down from that cross. They put you in the tomb. But God, you didn't stay in that tomb. On Sunday morning, you came back from the dead. You rose. You're alive. You're the king. You're victorious. And so, God, we're here to make much of you. And so, God, be honored and be glorified and always say and do it how we say it and do it here. Lord, as we're out, about to open up your word and hear from Pastor Rob, Lord, change us. I pray every single Sunday the same thing, that everybody that walked in on this campus will leave different because we've been with the family of God in your presence. So God, have your will in your way. Change our hearts, change our lives. God, for the skeptic, 
who's not sure about, can somebody come back from the dead, God? Show them that you're the God of miracles. God, for those who think that their marriage, their life, their friendships are too far gone, remind them that because you came back from the grave, hope is alive as well. Anything is possible. You can resurrect anything, God. So God, restore them with hope. And for those who've never said yes to you, Father, I pray today's the day they see that you love them and you came to share your life with them, to forgive them and invite them into this deep, beautiful relationship. So God, help them say yes. And God, for those who are just trying to faithfully follow you, encourage them. God, continue to infuse their hope and their life with excitement, Father, and change all of us, God. So God, be honored and glorified in what we're doing here. God, because we love you and you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. So God, we're here for you. It's in your beautiful and holy name we pray, amen. Happy Easter, everybody. Man, y'all look so good. I wish I could see everyone's faces in the theater. I know that thing is packed out. We might have some people in the uh, welcome home room. I know we have people out on uh, the atrium. Uh, And so, man, just so, so absolutely thrilled that you are all here today. Truly, truly, truly. Today, if you don't know, is kind of what we refer to as the Super Bowl of Christianity. (laughs) Right? Because every other Sunday... And every other day, for that matter, reverberates from this day in history. And there's a a kind of a call and response that's been going on for years and years and years in the church. It's where usually the pastor says something, a phrase, and then there's a phrase repeated. Usually what is said from here from the stage is, he is risen. And then what you say is, hold on, I know, you're like, we're ready. (laughs) Not everybody knows, all right? And then you respond with, he is risen indeed. So here we go. Now at the fish. Are you ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Come on with that. That's so good. That's so good. Well, hey, listen, I am so excited because next year, not only will we be, will we be celebrating this day here and online, but also we will, we will be well into our Sewell Mill campus, our second location. So excited. Very, very excited. We're running out of room. We've got to go other places, so... God be the glory. All right. Well, listen, I love that you are all here. I love that you're all here regardless if uh, whether or not someone actually invited you here but promised you, in order to get you here, promised you a meal afterwards, right? Or maybe she invited you and she's just too pretty to say no to. I get it. I don't care. Whatever the reason, we are thrilled, truly thrilled that you are here. And I know that for some of you, you've shown up. And for you to show up at a church, well, that's a big deal. Perhaps you went to church one time or a couple of times, or maybe you grew up in church, but something somewhere along the way, you felt judged, or you felt that God wasn't interested in you, or maybe you were made to feel that God wasn't interested in you, and if that's you, I am so, so sorry that happened. That is not the way of Jesus. But I love that you're here today, and I think essentially there's really kind of three groups of people that show up on Easter. I think there's people who believe in the resurrection, of course, the resurrection of Jesus, but there are moments where you wonder. You wonder when, like when you face pain or when you encounter sadness or sickness or financial uncertainty or maybe when you're standing in a cemetery. You wonder, is it really true? Like, is there more to this life than just this life? And I think there's also a group of people that are here, and you're here, because like I said earlier, somebody invited you, someone asked you to come with them, but truth be told, mentally and emotionally, you've got your arms crossed, and you wonder how anyone in the world could believe that someone could come back from the dead. How is that even possible, you think? And hopefully, I can give you some words that might help to remove some or all of those obstacles for you today. And then, I think there's a third group of people that perhaps you grew up in church, and there was a time when you had faith, 
But over the course of your life, some of your questions surpassed kind of your Sunday school or kids' ministry answers. They just no longer satisfy. And instead of asking a pastor or digging deeper on your own, you kind of just threw your hands up and you said, you know what, forget it. But you're here today, perhaps to give God one more chance. And so today, I hope, I hope to speak to all of us. But here's the thing. This is a big room. And just to kind of pull the curtain back, as pastors, we don't think that, that a sermon is the best context or environment for that kind of full conversation. We found that those moments are really best served over a, a cup of coffee, where we can just listen, truly listen to one another, to, to hear your story, to hear your thoughts, to hear your feelings, because your story and your thoughts and your feelings, well, they're important, they matter. So, if it's possible, here's what I'd like to do. I would love for you to imagine that it was just you and me, and we're just sitting down, just you and me over a cup of coffee. And, and in that time, we were able just to have a conversation about why Easter is actually so important. And I would probably start with this idea that, you know what, the world, man, it's messed up. It's broken. And I'm sure we would agree, specifically when we brought up things that make us sad or make us mad. One of us, both of us, would probably bring up the shootings in schools or the wars that are still raging around the world or things like corporate greed, rising inflation, gang violence, political division, cancel culture. We could talk about issues all over the world like injustice and racism, cybercrime and human trafficking. But here's the thing. After that, we'd have to get to this point here. It's not just the brokenness of our world. It's the brokenness in each of us. We're like, we're broken as people. Now, you might not agree with me at first, but I don't think it would take you long because think about this. When life splashes up on you or people rub you the wrong way, if you're like me, you're probably shocked and maybe embarrassed at how quickly you can lose your cool. I mean, somebody cuts you off in traffic around here and you pronounce eternal damnation on their soul for crying out loud. <laughs> can we just keep it real? And I'm sure that most of us would admit that we're really not the people that we want to be, at least not all the time. We long for a better world, yeah, but we also long to be better people. But see, when God created the world, it wasn't like this. I mean, it was perfect. It was ideal. It was a, it was a place of beauty where... We lived in loving relationship with God and with each other and even with ourselves. See, Adam and Eve, our, our first parents, our, the first humans, they lived in sweet fellowship with God and with one another. And they had a God that, that they knew loved them. They had a, a God who guided them, who provided for them, who protected them. I mean, they had a God, a, a leader, a, a father, or a, a king, if you will, and like the parents of a toddler, that God, their leader, their, their father, their king, they, he loved them by telling them where they could go and then where they shouldn't, or what they could touch or eat, or, and then what they shouldn't, because he loved them. And what's tragic, though, is that we didn't like it that way. We wanted life on our own terms where we get to call the shots on what is right and what is wrong. We get to define the terms, and it shouldn't surprise us, and it probably doesn't surprise us because we still do the same thing today, big shocker. And so, because of our self-involvement, we damaged everything. See, Adam and Eve chose to follow a new leader that what they found in the garden, one whose advice and counsel really seemed like he had their best interest in mind just simply because it, it happened to match their own desires. But it turned out to be just the opposite. He wasn't, he was really only concerned with their destruction, not their survival, not their flourishing. And in that, we damaged our relationship with God and which, with each other and even with ourselves. And as a result, we inflicted ourselves with a spiritual disease called sin, and we discovered that that disease is fatal, and actually it affects our forevers. But here's the thing. It wasn't just a decision. It, it became the pattern of our lives. 
And here's what you and I have to come to grips with. Here's the, the hard pill that each of us have to swallow. That ultimately the hatred and the jealousy and the racism, sexism, corruption, injustice, just the evil in the world, it was created and perpetuated by us collectively, humanity. And through us, we damaged everything. But here's one of the most important things that I'm going to say today. But God loved us too much to leave us that way. Amen? See, before God created his most prized and loved creation, humanity, imperfect humanity, me and you, he had already put his solution into play. 2,000 years ago, God showed up in this world in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, to rescue and restore us. I mean, basically, Easter is the story of how God revealed that solution, his solution, how he fixed a broken world, how we, how, we, how we would fix broken lives. I mean, just listen to one of Jesus' disciples, what he says about him. And just for context's sake, this is one of the many people who not only saw Jesus die on the cross, not only saw him raised on Sunday, but later would be killed for telling people about what he saw. He simply wouldn't recant what he said he saw with his own eyes. His name is Peter. Let's check him out here in 1 Peter. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. See, Jesus knew the only way, the only way to destroy sin, that which infects us, was to let it affect him. So he died the death that we were already dying and would ultimately and eventually eternally experience. Why? In order to give us the life we could never, ever, ever get on our own. And so that's why when Jesus went to the cross, it wasn't a surprise. God wasn't shocked by all of that. It was quite planned. And possibly you might ask the question, well, how can I know that? I mean, it seems too good to be true, and if that's where you are, please hear, hear me. I get it. I get it. Really, I do. I get it. So what I want to do with most of our time rela- remaining is I just want to read from a passage from the Apostle Paul that just contains some facts that give us extraordinary reason, reasons to believe in the resurrection. So here's what Paul wrote in Corinthians, his first letter. He says, I passed on to you what was most important. Some translations say what was of first importance. And what had also been passed on to me, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12, talking about the disciples. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later all of the apostles. Last of all, as though though I'd been born at the wrong time, I saw him. uh, I also saw him. So what he means by that is like later on, after all this happened, Jesus reappeared to him. And if Christ had not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sin. So that's the point to go, if this didn't happen, guess what your problem is? Your faith is useless, and you, you're still guilty of your sins. You still don't have a solution. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So the apostle Paul was highly educated, highly educated. And here's what Paul's saying. This is not about intelligence, and this is not about theory. This is a simple case of eyewitness testimony. It's a simple case of eyewitness accounts, logic, and then trust for those who did not get to see him with their own eyes. The truth is, you can have extraordinary confidence in the resurrection. And here's just some simple facts to kind of highlight, pull them out. Here's the thing. Jesus of Nazareth died on a Roman cross in 30 to 32 AD. Go outside of the Bible. Just Google it. Okay? It's recorded in historical documents outside of the Bible. The second thing is simply this. Hundreds of people said that they saw the the resurrected Jesus. And what's amazing about all of this is that they were followers of Jesus But when Jesus went to the cross, all of his disciples, save John, they unfollowed him. I mean, they were done with it because they saw Jesus die, and they expected Jesus to do what dead people do, stay dead. 
No one. Like, no one was waiting at the tomb. Even though Jesus had said, hey, I will die for your sins on the third day, I'll rise from the dead. No one, just to make sure we understand here, it wasn't like there's a big group of people showed up at the tomb on Sunday morning counting down. Ten, nine, he's coming. Eight, get ready. Oh, I'm so excited. No one was doing that. Because see, all their hopes, all their, all their dreams, they died with him. And you can see it through the stories. They weren't expecting him. Here's one example in John's Gospel, chapter 20. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Mary Magdalene was a person whom Jesus healed. She became a follower of Jesus. She came to the tomb, and to her surprise, she found that there was no body. Like, you picking up what I'm throwing down? Nobody expected no body. See what I did there with the two words and the one? Yeah, see? I mean, here's the thing. No one expected that. No one expected that. And so she's afraid. She didn't know what's up. And then there's two angels at the tomb to add to her, a little bit of her fear. And they asked her a couple of questions. Now, one of the age-old debates among scholars is, are the angels male or female at the tomb? Because they're going to ask a question. And when they answer this question, uh, I believe their question in itself answers the question. Clearly, they are obviously male. Because only a man would ask the question, woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? <laughs> like, if you're an unmarried man, you need, to, you need to take that pro tip down now. <laughs> Don't let those words come out of your mouth. <laughs> Hashtag pastor humor. Okay, anyway, so, so they ask that question, and then they say, hey, why are you looking for Jesus among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. That's where we get the phrase. And then Mary would say the most amazing thing. See, when she finally did see Jesus around there, she thought he was the gardener. Like, I can only imagine that for years that was part of her story, right? She's sitting around talking to people going, and of course, I mean, I thought, I thought he was the gardener. Why? Well, because no one expected him to be alive. See, they responded to Jesus just the way that you would expect. It's impossible. It's unbelievable. It can't happen. But here's the kicker. It was absolutely undeniable. And for the next six weeks, Jesus would appear over and over again to those disciples. You know why? Because I think it took that long to convince them. I'm sure they were like, I think I talked to him yesterday, but can that be right? I got to go see him again. Jesus changed everything. When what they saw, what they expected, here's the thing. The seemingly impossible was absolutely undeniable. And so you know what they did? They turned to the social media of their day. They began to tell everybody, mostly through word of mouth. They also wrote books. They wrote it down. Those eyewitnesses would write the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See, Jesus changed their lives, and they expected their eyewitness accounts to change the lives of other people. But long before they wrote those books down, those disciples showed up in downtown Jerusalem days after Jesus died, and they pointed at the people who were just cheering him on the week before, who were hurling insults at him and saying, crucifying, he said, hey, Jesus, who you killed, by the way. Jesus, the, the author of life, who you put on a cross, by the way, right over there. Not in the galaxy far, far away, not once upon a time, no, no, no. Just a few days ago, right over there. And then, by the way, you buried him right <laughs> over there. That tomb is empty, if you don't know. And you can go check it out for yourself, because he is risen, and we have seen him. And thousands of people believed. And thanks to the, the roads that the Romans built back in the day, made it, which made it easier to travel, Christianity exploded beyond the first century and made, it all, made, it, it made its way all the way here exponentially to the 21st century. And it was not that he was a good teacher. It was not that he was a good man. It was not the blind faith of the disciples that convinced him. No, it was the fact of the resurrection. And then the, the third fa fact that we see we bring out simply simply this, um, the perspective and life change of the Apostle Paul. See, the Apostle Paul is the most respected, reliable, and trustworthy person that writes in that time. And what's amazing is that he started off not believing in the resurrection at all, just the opposite. He oppressed anyone who believed in the resurrection. He opposed them and even had many of them killed. But then he became a follower of Jesus after Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus. And then he went and interviewed Peter. 
And he talked to James, and he talked to some of those 500 people that saw Jesus. And then he was even more convinced. And that's why the one who wrote that, that phrase, that passage I read to you early in 1 Corinthians, right? that's why he's like, I get it. That's why he says, I'm giving you what is of first importance, the most important thing. Lock this down. Right? They gave this to me. He gave this to me. I talked to Peter. I talked to James. I talked to all these people. I'm convinced that the resurrection actually happened. See, sometimes I have conversations with people or I'll just hear it. They'll say things like, well, Christianity is so exclusive. Actually, I just want to say, Sparky, read the Bible. Christianity is the most inclusive faith out there. Look what Paul says here in his second letter. He says, he died for everyone. Now, listen, I realize you need to go get a master's degree from seminary to translate that Greek word. Because in the Greek, you know what it means? Everyone. (laughs) I'm just kidding with the... He died for everyone. So that those who receive his new life, right, whosoever believes, will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could be included in his life. There is no exclusiveness in Christianity. The reason that you want to believe in the resurrection and surrender your life to God through Jesus is because it makes your life better and it makes you better at life. And you may go, well, how? Well, here's just to name a few. First of all, there's forgiveness. Forgiveness for all your sins and your brokenness. You see, shame and guilt, they are powerful forces that are corrosive to our souls. And Jesus is the only one who can take away that shame and the penalty for our guilt. See, we'll always be guilty of our sins, meaning that we'll never be exonerated. But Jesus atoned for our sin. He paid the price for our guilt. As I was told years and years ago, we did the crime, but Jesus did the time. In his letter to the followers of Jesus and Colossae, Paul says this. He says, you were dead because of your sins, dead, spiritually dead, and because of your sinful nature. It was not yet cut away. But then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of our sins. So without Jesus, we are all walking around spiritually dead. See, he forgave all of our sins, past, present, and future, completely and for good. It's called grace, which simply means unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, and you couldn't earn it. It had to be given to you. It had to be done for you. And if you're just visiting with us or you haven't been here for a while, we've been in this teaching series that we just called Famous Last Words where we've just simply been looking at the last words of Jesus. And the words we've been looking at, the whole context is when Jesus was on the cross, the phrases, the words that he spoke while he was on the cross. And when you read John's gospel, the very last words that Jesus said is simply this, to tell us die. It simply means it is Finished. It does not mean I am finished. Actually, it means I am just beginning. It is finished. See, he did everything that his loving Heavenly Father asked him to do for our behalf. He showed us how to live, and he died for us so that we could truly live. And I don't mean that we just get to live eternally with him after we die. I especially mean that we get to live now, his spirit in us, alive and kicking. See, Jesus, listen, some of you need to hear this today. Jesus has to mean more to us than a get out of hell free card. That is part of the gospel. See, in, in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul's, Paul writes this. He says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. You see, God isn't just looking to forgive us. To forgive us, He wants to move within us. Actually, he wants us in the family. He wants us to act like a family while we have air in our lungs. He wants to transform us from the inside out to be more like Jesus, or as the Apostle Paul would say, conform us into the image of Christ. And he, and he wants us to, he, rather, he wants to do that so that he can use us as a force of good and love and peace and light in this broken world in which we find ourselves. He wants to use us to help redeem and repair so much of the brokenness that we see in this world, what gets, kind of gives us angst. 
to make sure you understand, Jesus is not looking for fans. He's looking for followers. And here's what I would also say. If I could just take a quick aside. For those of you who only come to church every once in a while, um, we're honored you're here, but I say this in love. Thinking about him in a place like this a few times a year isn't going to move the needle. It's not going to fix the brokenness in this world, and it definitely doesn't get you to where he wants you to be. So perhaps maybe you, you've taken a hiatus from church or from faith for a while, and like I, I said this at, at Christmas time, I have conversations with different people um, out in community at various places I, I frequent, like the gym or the grocery store or wherever, and people sometimes come up to me, and they're like, hey, and they have this first look of like, hey, then they kind of go, huh, whatever, and maybe they'll say something like this, hey, man, we used to, I used to go to church uh, you know, we, we just got out of the habit. I just, you know, here's the thing. We just become inconsistent. I mean, we'll watch on, online every once in a while, but between work, I mean, come on, between work and kids' sports and, you know, vacations and places and, you know, just stuff, I've just been inconsistent. And what I want you to hear is that it's not what you do inconsistent, inconsistently that changes you. You know that. It's your consistency that changes you. And since we live in this culture that always has something else vying for our attention, I just want to slide a challenge across the table to everyone here. This is for everyone in the room. Here's what I'd love. Here's what I'm asking, humbly yet boldly. For the next two months, when I am in town, I won't miss a weekend of church. Now, I know some of you right now, I know what you're saying. Man, would I work out of town sometimes? I travel. We've got a mountain house. We've got a lake house. We've got a beach house. I know, I get it. And if you have one, good on you. (laughs) And when you're there, great, watch online, whatever. But when I am in town for the next two months, I won't miss a weekend of church. And parents, I'm kind of speaking to you also pretty specifically. For your kids, do that for them. Because here's why. Experts say that it takes two months of doing something consistently for it to become a habit. So I'm asking In April and May, I want all of us just to make the commitment to be in God's presence and with other followers of Jesus, that we would make that a priority. Because sometimes people would say this. If I meet them, connect with them, whatever, or or I meet them after a a, a service uh, and they don't go here normally, I'll hear people say things like this. It just does something in my heart to come to your Easter or your Christmas services and just sing those songs. Well, here's what I want to say. Guess what? It ain't the songs. It's the Spirit of God that is urging you, beckoning you to draw near to him. And here's the thing. If you don't know, we do this every Sunday, every single Sunday, because we believe that that corporate worship on Sundays is one of the most important things that we can do as followers of Jesus. Like like we often say, where else are you going to find a group of people who who are of different ages? or from different socioeconomic backgrounds and different ethnicities who come together as friends and family. Like, here's what we know. The world or Satan wants to divide us and pit us against each other. Just go look at social media, watch the news. It shouldn't take you long. But here's what God wants. He wants to actually unite us to be a family, to be a light of love and grace and compassion in this world. And every single Sunday, through the teaching of his word and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I know that God wants to be with every one of us together and teach us something together. So I ask you humbly but joyfully that you would please, please make this environment of grace and love a priority in the next two months. And for those of you who will take me up on this challenge, God will begin to change things within you. If you're not a normal attender, he'll, he'll do, I just trust me, it happens. If you don't believe me, Come and see. Come and see for yourself, and then tell me about it later. So, if it was just me and you having a cup of coffee, just having a conversation, here's here's what would happen. Before I left, before we got up, I'd probably try to hug you, and you'd go, that's awkward, but that's fine. (laughs) And I would ask you a question. I'd say, so what do you think? I mean, after everything that I just shared with you about the resurrection, what do you think? What do you believe? And you know what I bet? 
Some of you just might say, well, you haven't answered all my questions. And you'd be right. I haven't. I know you have questions, and I know I haven't answered all your questions. But I would look at you and simply ask this. So just to to make sure I'm understanding, so you're saying that you need all of your questions answered before you decide something important? And some of you would foolishly say yes. But then my retort would simply be this. So, again, just to be clear, you don't make any major major decisions in life until you have all of your questions answered. Aren't you married? (laughs) Aren't you married? I mean, listen, so you're saying you got married and you had all your questions answered. No, you didn't, Sparky. And, hey, by the way, don't you have kids? Because I know you didn't have all of your questions answered before you started having kids. None of us. None of us did that. We couldn't. And listen, by the way, you chose a major, or you chose a career, you chose a house to purchase, a, spend a lot of money, and you didn't have all of your questions answered. The truth is, just like the rest of us, you have a habit of making major decisions in your life when you don't have all of your questions answered. So then it's really just one thing. There's really only one thing that you really need to know, and it's simply this. There is a supernatural God that exists. And that God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. God loved, so God gave. So that anyone who trusts in him can live. You know, when I I talk to people about Jesus, sometimes a smaller crowd or a one-on-one, every once in a while, Every once in a while, I will run across someone who gets up in my face and says, prove it. Prove it. I can't. I can't prove it. But they could. Those 500-something people, they could. Those disciples, they could. The Apostle Paul, he could. And then they would go on to prove it by each of them Dying at different places in the world at different times because they simply wouldn't stop telling people about what they said they saw with their own eyes. I had a young man come up to me recently and say, hey, whenever, it's, whenever you have moments of doubt in your faith, because I imagine you have them, and I said, yeah. When you have moments of doubt in your faith, what is it that brings you back? That's a great, great question, and I have a very clear answer. I, too, of course, I have moments of doubt. To doubt means to be human. But without exception, you know what I come back to? I come back to, if there was one person who made up a story, and then they wound up dying for the lie they knew was a lie, sure, chalk it up to people have mental problems or whatever. But all those disciples... And so many of those 500, but by the way, would not stop telling people, and they found themselves in a Roman arena being torn apart by lions. All of those disciples, go do some research and see how they were killed. All of those people dying for something they made up. It's not intellectually satisfying to me. Maybe it is for you, but every single time I come back to them and go, this has to be true. It has to be true. And if that's true, the rest of it's true. I mean, think about this. If I ask you to prove that George Washington existed, what are you going to do? Send me a video? No, of course you're not. Why? Because that technology didn't exist back then. Here's what you're probably going to do. You're probably going to show me a document or a history book. Well, when it comes to Jesus, right, I'm just going to show you a history book the best-selling book of all time, the one that talks about what he did and what he said and who he was and who he still is today, the one who loves us immeasurably more than we could ever possibly imagine, the one who died and lives for us to be a light in this dark and broken world because people matter to him. And North Metro, you and I, we can be a light of grace and truth and love and compassion. You know why? Because he is risen. risen Amen. Let's pray. 
Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for your providence. We thank you for your sovereignty, what you did for us, Lord. The greatest demonstration that any human being has ever seen of love in this world is the cross, that you would send your son to die for us, to give us something that we most definitely did not deserve and we definitely couldn't earn. It speaks to your grace, your love for us, that you desire to be with us now and eternally. So Father, we just wanna say thank you. I realize that most of the people within the sound of my voice, they love you, they praise you, they worship you, they follow you, they... But I also know every single week you do this, specifically around Easter, you woo people here to get their attention, to finally surrender their pride, so to surrender their will, to finally give up and say, I cannot keep writing my own Bible, believing my own Bible and thinking God will accept my version of it. As I read in the scripture, there is no such thing as being a good person getting you into heaven. The only, only way is forgiven people are with you eternally. And so here's the thing, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if I'm talking to you, if I'm reading your mail, if you've never had that conversation with God, if you've never had that moment just to confess that to him, I don't care if you put your cheeks in a seat in a church, it doesn't really matter. It's like sitting in a car makes you a, sitting in a garage makes you a car. Have you ever had that conversation with God to humble yourself? And so if you never have, with our eyes closed and our, and our heads bowed, I'm just gonna give you some words. If I'm talking to you, I'm gonna give you some words that in your head and your heart that you would just make them your own. But maybe you say something like this, the Heavenly Father, I am, I'm done justifying, I'm done making things up, I'm done rationalizing my behavior and just thinking you'll be okay with all of it. Here's the reality, I am a sinner just like everybody else and I cannot save myself. You went to great lengths to prove your love and so I right now, I confess you, you, King Jesus, you are Savior, you are Lord, you're my Savior, you're my Lord. And your word says that with that confession, that supernaturally, you moved me from death to life to able, enable, to me even for, enable me to even make that confession. And you give me your spirit to dwell with my spirit, to guide me and lead me, to empower me, to gift me and to comfort me. And one day, just like everyone else, I'm gonna breathe my last, my last breath. But, it, but I'm not gonna get what I deserve. I'm gonna get what Jesus deserved because he gave it to me and I trust in him. And I will see you face to face one day and I will see you and I will be received as your adopted daughter, your adopted son. And so here's what I wanna do with our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer, if you had that conversation with God for the first time in your life, man, we wanna celebrate with you, but here's how we do it here. We got a team of people, we just have a gift we're gonna put in your hands. It's just a bag with a Bible and there's a devotional in there and then there's some other information about next steps. We wanna to talk to you about baptism, but we also wanna hear your story and celebrate with you, but the ball's gonna be in your court. So here's what I want. With your eyes still closed, your head still bowed, nobody's looking at you. They just wanna put that gift in your hand. If you're anywhere on campus right now, just raise your hand and they will get that to you right now, just where you are. And just let you know, and scripture says that when one person moves from death to life, when one person makes that great repentance and confession, that declaration that all of heaven is celebrating. So wherever you are, just raise your hand, they'll get that to you. And if you're watching online right now, there'll be a little kind of prompt that comes up. You click that and one of our pastors will get to you ASAP. God, we thank you so much. Thank you for your grace. We run in it, we live in it, Lord. We find our being in it. We thank you, thank you, thank you. It always is about you, but today, is that day where we get to make so much about you move in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey, church, who just got taken back down memory lane right there with that song? I kept envisioning Daniel, 13 years old, wearing a two-piece uh, button-down suit, you know, tie, looking like he, uh, so good, so good. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today celebrating the resurrection of King Jesus. Hey, life is worth the living because he lives, amen? And because he lives, all fear is gone. There's hope for tomorrow. There's hope for anything you face. And so we just want to encourage you in that and look to Jesus, look to Jesus. And if there's anything we can do for you, if you're a family member, if you're new here, you're checking this place out, I want to encourage you, hey, grab this connection card. It's in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you have a question or anything that you want to ask us about this church or how to get plugged in here, uh, just encourage you to take this connection card, fill it out. You can give it to a host team member on the, uh, as you leave. Again, they'll have some baskets, and they'd love to uh, just grab that for me, and we'd love to follow up and help you take a step into what God is calling you into as far as here. And as far as what we're doing here, I want to encourage you. Hey, look around. Again, we talked about the goodness here. Hey, here's the cool thing. We do this every Sunday, right? Amen. We get to celebrate with the family of God, making much of Jesus every single Sunday. So if you have a church home, hey, go to your church. But if you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you come back here because next week we, we kick off a new series through the book of Colossians. Uh, we're going to take a journey, 10 weeks through the book of Colossians. And the series is called All Things Hold Together. And it's birthed out of Colossians 1.17 that says, In Him, Jesus Christ, all things hold together. Jesus holds all things together. So we'll look at that and make much of Jesus. So I just want to encourage you to, to come back next week. And if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know, especially if you're like, hey, I need some prayer. I uh, just want to encourage you right now, if you need some prayer, there's an altar down here. You can come and get prayed over. We have a prayer team to be here, and we'd love to pray with you and for you and just tr try to be a blessing to your life. But as we think about being a blessing, hey, you're about to be sent out to be a blessing to people. So go love people. Go enjoy your Easter. Make sure you get your, your fancy pictures made and celebrate the resurrection of King Jesus because he is risen. Hey, can we just real quick try that again? Because uh, I expected more from you. I was like, you know what? I should have just dismissed you, but I can't let you go like that, right? Okay? So can we, can we rewind it. Rewind it. Hey, church, he's risen. That's right. That's right. Hey, love you guys. You're dismissed. Have a great day. Thank you for celebrating this Easter with us. Today, we rejoice in Jesus' resurrection, and indeed, He is risen. If you're not already part of our NMC family, we want to invite you to join us in person next week. We also want to connect with you. Whether you have questions or if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you can take your next step by heading to northmetro.org slash next steps. Happy Easter, North Metro Church. Thank you for being a part of this special celebration. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday.